And what I want us to do is I want us to just bow together and I want us to pray and to pray out audibly to the Lord because we want the Lord to come near. We want him to speak into our hearts. We want him to work in our lives. So let's just bow together and then we're going to pray. I'll lead in prayer and if you pray the words after me and we'll seek God together. Heavenly Father, we bow in your presence. We, your presence. we, acknowledge, that you are the Lord. we acknowledge that you are the Lord. We come to you, come to you. In, repentance. in repentance. We're sorry for all our sins. We're sorry for all our sins. And we pray that your precious blood, your precious blood would be applied to our lives just now. Release us, Lord, from everything that holds us, everything that the enemy has placed upon our lives. Grant us true freedom and liberty. Open our spirit to the Holy Spirit. Unblock our, spiritual ears, Unblock our spiritual ears that we can hear your voice. Hear your voice. Come, and have your way. Come and have your way. And in all things, in all things may, your name be may your name be glorified. For Jesus' sake. For Jesus sake. Amen. amen. And amen. Let's read together from Nehemiah chapter 1. Nehemiah chapter 1. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. And it came to pass in the month Chislu, in the twentieth year, as I was in Shushan the palace, that Hananiah, one of my brethren, came, he and certain men of Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left of the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said unto me, The remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gate thereof are burned with fire. It came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and wept, and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven, and said, I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God, that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments. Let thine ear now be attentive and thine eyes open, that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant, which I pray before thee now, day and night for the children of Israel, thy servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against thee, both I and my father's house have sinned. We have dealt very corruptly against thee, and have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the judgments, which thou commandest thy servant Moses. Remember, I beseech thee the word that thou commandest thy servant Moses, saying, If ye transgress, I will scatter you abroad among the nations. But if ye turn on to me, and keep my commandments, and do them, though there were of you cast out unto the uttermost parts of the heaven, yet will I gather them from thence." and will bring them unto the place that I have chosen to set my name there. Now these are thy servants and thy people, whom thou hast redeemed by thy great power and by thy strong hand. O Lord, I beseech thee, let now thine ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant and to the prayer of thy servants, who desire to fear thy name and prosper. I pray thee, thy servant, this day, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for I was the king's cupbearer. Amen. And we know God will bless the reading of his word. Let's bow again in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just come into your presence tonight in the worthy name of the Lord Jesus. And Father, we do acknowledge our great need, and we bow before you. And Lord, we invite you to come by the power of the Holy Spirit, to come and minister into our lives. 
to come, Lord, and work deep in our hearts. We pray, Lord, that you would close us in with your Son. We pray that you would put a wall of protection round about us, and that, Lord, we would be very conscious of your presence. We pray that you will cleanse and sanctify the atmosphere of this room. We pray that you will cleanse it and make it holy. And, O oh Lord Jesus, we ask that you will come and walk in this room tonight, that you will draw near and speak. Lord, we acknowledge our need, and I lay myself before you. I give all I have and am to you, and I claim your cleansing and sanctifying power on my spirit, soul, and body. And I pray, Lord, for the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. More of the Holy Spirit, Lord. More of the Holy Spirit. We invite thee, Lord, to send the Spirit of God in power amongst us. Lord, come. Come, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Last week, those of you who were here will remember that Esther spoke a little regarding our identity. And she was talking a little about Esther in the Bible and also talking about uh, the servant of God, Gideon, and how that they were called from really nothing and, and no bodies in certainly Israel's history to become great leaders and very instrumental in saving the people of God. And they became so wonderfully used by the Lord. And so they reached, as it were, and fulfilled their destiny. And that's what I want to speak on very simply this evening, about coming into your destiny. Regardless of your background, regardless of what you think you are, the point is when God made you, God implanted in you desires. God knew you would become his child. He knew you before the foundations of the world. And that means that you're extremely important to God, even though you might not think that you're that important in life. Things may have been said over your life. Things may have been said to you. You may have said things about yourself that really you're not much worth and there's nothing much that God could do with you. God would like you to repent of, first of all, that attitude because that attitude actually will rob you of your destiny. Saying such things over your lives and proclaiming that you'll never be anything is one of Satan's methods of preventing you finding and fulfilling your destiny. The Word of God tells us here about a man called Nehemiah. As I've said, Nehemiah was God's builder. He certainly couldn't be regarded as a nobody. He was certainly a somebody in the nation in which he lived and served. But God was going to take him from a very high-powered career into the building of a work and establishing something that would honor God and would greatly encourage God's people and would leave him ever being remembered by all posterity that he was God's servant and that he did what God had saved him to do. He performed and he worked out his destiny. The thing about Nehemiah that we find is that his background is one of a life of, could we say, luxury. He was a man with great wealth. He was a man with great influence. He was the king's cupbearer. Now, the king that he's talking about is a great empire in the Bible called the Persian Empire. It came after the Babylonian Empire. And God makes great reference in his word, especially in the Old Testament, through these various empires that rose up and then fell. 
And in these empires who had by now taken over the nation of Israel, they had lost their country, but they had not lost their identity. They were still, even they were scattered from their country because of sin. They had scattered to different parts of the Babylonian empire, and then it became the Persian empire. And so this man who was a Jew was in a very high position. And of course, that was God's doing. It's interesting down the centuries that no matter how people have tried to destroy the Jewish people, that God has always interjected and saved them. And the most recent and powerful illustration was that of the Nazis under Germany and Hitler. How that they wanted to exterminate and wipe out this people and God stepped in and protected them. And he always will. That will always be the focus in the affairs of the world until the Lord Jesus returns. The Jews will always be a people who will be hated. They will be a people who are surrounded by their enemies and they will be dealt with in terrible ways. The Bible tells us in the Old Testament before God steps in and totally deals with the nations that are opposed to them and whenever he lifts up the nation of Israel and makes Jerusalem a praise in the earth and the center of the earth. It will no longer be New York or London or Berlin, but it will be Jerusalem will be the center of the earth where the Lord Jesus shall reign uh, sitting on the seat of his father David. So this empire uh, had a region in it called Judah. Now, this man was the cup, king's cupbearer. His job was he was going to give drink and eat, and then he would check the food to see there was no poison in it, and then it would be given to the king. So it was a very, very important job. The Bible tells us that 150 years before that the walls of Jerusalem had been broken down by the Babylonians. And so these people who had, he was living, he had never been there. He was living in the luxury of the Persian palace. But as he looked out uh, and he was aware that there was this region where he, his family had come from called Judah. And many years before there had been little groups of Jews had returned to that, that, por that portion of land and they had rebuilt the temple and they had built their houses and they were living there, but there was no walls around the city, no protection. And so the problem that is arising at this point, the destiny for this particular man is in order to bring back these walls, in order to build up a place for protection. And you know, it's very possible you can be a Christian, that is, you can have the temple established in your life. The temple is the place where, where we worship God. It's the place where we commune with God. And you know, you can have a temple raised up in your life, but if you don't have walls around, and you have no defenses and no protection from the enemy, your ability to worship God is going to be greatly limited. Your ability to stay in communion with God is going to be broken if the walls are not built. And so God is raising up a man from this affluent lifestyle to find his destiny in rebuilding the walls and in building up the people of God and in dealing with a lot of sin that was going on among the people of God, there was a lot of Jews had been living immorally. There had been a lot of corruption financially. There was, there was many things that were going on. The Sabbath day for the Jews was being totally desecrated. They were buying and selling. And it was this man of his own expense. He didn't get a salary. He went in of his own wealth and he was used by God to change this right around. 
to bring the people of God back in to fellowship and get the walls rebuilt. Now, what are the walls for you and I? Whenever we come to the Lord, the Holy Spirit enters into our spirit. And the Bible says that we are sealed with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes in and he witnesses to us. He bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. So the child of God has this inner witness that I know that I belong to the Lord. I know that if anything happens to me, I will be with the Lord because you have the witness or the inner awareness from the Holy Spirit that you belong to the Lord. But these walls that are then built to aid you in continual worship with God, these walls have to be put up in your Christian life. And I just want to allude to them very simply. The walls that we need up in our lives as Christians, if we are going to stay in a place of communion and fellowship with God and abiding in Jesus. And the first one is used in Ephesians 6, and it's called the armor of God. The armor of God. One of the things that you must recognize if you are beginning to commune with God, as you yield your life completely to the Lord and give yourself unreservedly to him, when that happens in your life and you begin to really trust God, what happens is you enter into a new dimension of warfare. You see, the Christian who is saved goes to meetings, involved in the denomination and that type of thing. They may encounter some measure of conflict, but you very fi often find that that Christian, most of their conflict is internal. Their conflict is with what we would call the flesh or perhaps demons. But the conflict is within maybe areas of lust or pride or worldliness or jealousy or envy. So it means that you really don't need to have much conflict with the devil because you, there's a civil war going on inside you and there's no threat of you ever getting on in relation to breaking through with God or certainly uh, finding or locating or, or working out your destiny. That's highly unlikely that that would happen. And so what God the Holy Spirit does in the life of the believer is that he brings an awareness to them that there is a civil war. He makes them aware that there are things that are grieving to him. And so the Holy Spirit propels the Christian to seek God. He, he propels the Christian to spend time waiting on God and praying the right prayers, which is, Lord, what is in my life that you don't like? What is in my home that you don't like? Now, you need to be very brave to pray like that. But that's the only way you'll ever find your destiny. Uh, Christianity is extremely radical, true Christianity. And you need backbone to find your destiny. That's very important. And there are many Christians that we come along, come across in the journey of life, and they want to go forward, they say. They want to grow, they say. They want to advance, they say. But there's not that inner backbone. There's not that real fight inside that says, whatever it costs, I will find what God has for me. I will break through where others won't. I will make the effort where others won't. That is so essential if you're to discover your destiny. But as I've said, many people have this inner civil war. And so the Lord, what he does is he brings us and draws us to himself so that as Christians, we begin to 
become aware of things in my life and heart and family and home and relationships that's not pleasing to God, and we start to repent over them. Lord, I'm sorry for that. I'm sorry for that relationship not right. I want to fix that, Lord. I'm sorry for that thing that I stole. I'm going to pay it back, Lord. And so you begin to come near to God, and God's holiness starts to permeate your life, and his holiness starts to impact you because you start to fix things that before you never bothered with. Now you have to fix them because you're starting to come into contact with God in a new way. When God gets hold of you, when God fills you with his Holy Spirit, he, by his Spirit, enthrones himself within you. Jesus takes the throne of your heart. That's where we get him such as king of my life. I crown thee now, thine shall the glory be. Him such as that. These hymn writers understood this principle where the Lord was enthroned in their hearts. Now what happens when the Holy Spirit is filling your personality and you are enthroning Jesus is that a new battle commences. This inner battle that was beforehand largely comes to a cease. It, it'll still rise up, but largely that battle comes to an end. The battle moves from within civil war to without. That's when the devil really comes in. And so there's a new battlefield, and the battlefield is the powers of darkness. And it is only really at that stage in the life of a Christian when they become aware, I need armor. Most Christians are not even aware that they need armor. There's no consciousness in their Christian life where they're saying, I need a protection here. I need a covering here. But when the Holy Spirit is filling you, you will sense in the battle, I need a covering. I need help because I'm facing things now that I didn't face before. And I'm encountering things that are dark and, and hurtful. And yet I know that the Lord is on the throne and he's greater. And so you become aware, I need to put this armor on. So we take on the helmet and the breastplate and the girdle and feet shod, sword and shield. You say, well, what significance is putting that armor on and how do you put it on? Well, you put it on by prayer. You put it on by prayer. Lord, I take the helmet of salvation over my mind. I take the breastplate of righteousness to cover my heart. I take the loins, my loins covered uh, regarding uh, uh, the truth and reproduction, reproducing truth. And then I take the, uh, the feet shod with the preparation of the gospel for proclaiming the gospel to others. And then the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and the shield of faith, wherewith we can withstand all the fiery darts that are coming. That's why as a spirit-filled Christian, you'll feel the darts. You'll sense them hitting you to burn you, and you have to take them out, and you have to remove them, and you have to ask the Lord to heal where you've been hurt, because as Christians, we are in a battle. And when you learn to use that armor, you will find that you are strengthened with God's might by his spirit in the inner man, and you begin to become an overcomer. And you start to enter into a new arena in the supernatural that you never experienced before. And you begin to worship God because the temple is safe now. The place where you worship God is safer because the walls are going up. And that's what was happening in the physical realm. I am simply spiritualizing what was, what was natural. So this man came along. I want you to notice very quickly that this man was not settled. That's very important. It's evident from the first few verses that although this man had an amazing career, although he had loads of money, although other people would have looked at him and said, you know, this guy has it made. And maybe somebody who's listening either to me tonight or somebody on a tape or DVD, people say about you, you've got it made. 
But inside, you're not settled. Inside, you know that there's more. Inside, you know that where you are is not where God intended you to be. There's something greater. Because when God saved you, he put in you a destiny. And anything other than getting God's destiny is failure and frustration. And so this man, despite all this, he had a deeper and an unsettled uh, sense inside. And that unsettledness was nothing more than the operation of the Holy Spirit. You see, this man, he was not unlike uh, Daniel. You remember Daniel was a great politician. He had a great job and career. But whenever he came to a crisis, Daniel, although he was in a high position like Nehemiah, when the day came and said, you've got to either bow to the government, the will of the people, or you obey God, that's your choice. And thank God Daniel did what he did. That's what made him the man he was. Daniel chose to reject political correctness. He rejected whatever society was saying in the day. It didn't matter what society was saying. Daniel went and knelt before the Lord the same as every other time, and he didn't care tuppence if he lost his position. His heart was after God, and he had an inner awareness that only God would meet his need. He had an inner awareness that I'll only have true contentment when God is all in all in my life. And friends, that's where you find true peace. That's where you find real contentment. It's not in possessions. It's not in achievements. It's not in your wisdom. It is in a close relationship with the creator of heaven and earth. A relationship that started at the new birth and will continue for all eternity. In order to find your, uh, your identity to come into your destiny, you have to be prepared and ready to move into the realm of the supernatural. And as I said, it'll take back bone in you. It'll take back bone. So this man was unsettled. How do we know he was unsettled? Well, how we know is that when he heard the news, let's, let's read it. It says in verse 2, Han and I came and, he, and I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped and which were left of the captivity and concerning Jerusalem. And they said, the remnant are left of the captivity are in, in great affliction and reproach. The wall is broken down, the gates are burned thereof. It came to pass when I heard these things that I sat down and wept and mourned and fasted many days. Josephus is a great, um, uh, he's a great historian. It's not, he's not, he's, anybody can look him up on the internet, read him, there's books about him. Josephus was a historian of that era. And he said that what happened was this man was going about in the royal palace, walking around the great Persian palace, and it was beautiful. And he heard these people speaking in the Jewish language. Because this man, Hananiah, doesn't seem to be his literal brother, but rather a Jewish brother, maybe one of the same tribe. And he heard them speaking, and Josephus said when he heard them speaking in that tongue, he went over to them. Now you and I know that whenever we meet together, perhaps in a home, or you meet a couple of Christians, say, what's happening in the church down in Belfast, or what's happening in the church in the south of Ireland? Some people say, oh, well, I hear souls are getting saved and things like that. That's great. That's wonderful. And tell me, that's a lovely car you have there. And wh when did you get that house there? That's a lovely house. I believe your man's building that there's about 50 grand for that. In other words, what I'm saying is, when we talk about these things, they can go in one ear and out the other. That's because it doesn't really affect us. But Nehemiah's not like that. When it goes into Nehemiah, it's stuck. It's not getting out. Because the man is unsettled. 
because God has a destiny for the man and the seed is planted in his heart and it can't get out. And no matter what he was going to be offered by anybody, it wasn't going to change it because this man's heart was prepared by the Lord. He was prepared. And that's the wonderful thing about being open to God. That's the wonderful thing of taking the steps where others won't step is because you will find that God will plant things in you. You find that God will perform things through you that you never anticipated. I remember a friend of mine telling how that uh, he was in the police and he was rising up the ranks of the police and doing exceptionally well in it and very uh, well to do and so on. And he said he would go in and he would be all police. And then he went to hear his pastor and his pastor preached about the, about the coat that was tied and how that the coat, the master had need of the coat, but the coat was tied and he was no use to God while he was tied. And the Holy Spirit began to speak to this policeman and said to him, you're tied. You're tied. You're no use to me. And he said, I, I would feel this awful unsettledness. And he said, I would go back into work on, a, on the next week and I would just be all police. And then he said, it would just, this would come over me. And then he said, I'd just lose all interest. No interest in the police at all. No interest in my job. Just couldn't get it together again. And he said, then I would try my best to get back into it again. And then it would all die again. And what was happening was that God was beginning to call this man. God was beginning to call him. You see, my dear friends, it's one thing to go to a Bible college. And I, 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 I'm in full agreement with young people going to Bible college, learn the Bible, brilliant. But going to Bible college is not the call of God. They're distinctly different. The call of God is whenever a man can't do anything else. There's nothing else he can do because God has left him in this position where he must or she must go this direction because they're so unsettled within by God regarding this seed, regarding this thing that God has planted in them concerning his purposes. Not only do we find a man not settled, but very quickly we find his knowledge. He receives knowledge, and from it, we've mentioned this already, from his knowledge that his brothers tells him, he becomes inquisitive. You see, he doesn't merely say, oh, well, that's sad. Dear, dear, isn't that terrible about the gates and the walls? He becomes inquisitive. He starts to find out. He starts to ask about what is happening. He has never been here. He has no obligation to go near these people. But you see, this is God at work. This is the Holy Spirit at work. God planting the seed. This concern for these people. That's what happens. I have met people who are missionaries. I find it amazing. They tell me about whatever job they're doing, maybe working in Northern Ireland, and then they get this amazing desire for this country, this bizarre, unique country that, that they've never heard about, and they have this pull toward this country. That's the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit bringing them into their destiny. And so he has a concern and an interest. You see, the same thing happened with Moses. Whenever Moses had been the uh, Prince Charles of Egypt coming to take the throne uh, via his mother to, to his, well, I suppose really, what would you call him? as like a stepfather, but he was going to come and take over from him anyway. He was the next, he was the next king of Egypt. And he saw two Jews fighting. And when he saw the Jews fighting, he, went, he intervened and he said, don't you be hurting him. And the boy turned round and he said to him, don't you be interfering. Don't you, don't you be interfering in our affairs. And then one killed the other. And the story goes on that Moses got into trouble because he had killed one. But the interesting thing is, why would this man, Moses, get involved in two Jews fighting when he's the next pharaoh of Egypt? Because the Bible tells us in the book of Acts that God put it in his heart to visit the children of Israel. God took this man in his high position in, the royal, in royalty and God put it in the man's heart. He had everything the world could give him, but God put it in his heart to visit the children of Israel. That's the way God works. That's the way God speaks. 
It's a very personal thing. It's a very individual thing. But it's an amazing thing because the implications are so far-reaching into the lives of so many people. Who can tell what will happen if you find your destiny? Who can find out who would even begin to know how many souls would come into the kingdom if you do what God saved you for? Who can tell? You see, friends, his knowledge wasn't merely knowledge. It led to sympathy. He was extremely sympathetic to these people. His heart was moved toward them. You know, it's interesting that whenever he was named by his father, that his father called him Nehemiah, which means comfort. He was going to bring great comfort to the people of God. I want you to notice that his unsettledness and his knowledge led to something happening. In other words, he didn't continually just go to meetings. He didn't just get into a rut. He now had a destiny. He now had something planted. It's only a seed, but he knows it. And it's something God has put in him. Could I ask you, do you have any idea what your destiny is? Has God planted anything in your heart? Have you ever asked him about your destiny? Have you ever asked him why he saved you? Well, it led to action. And the action that was in his heart was he was going to prepare to go and build the walls. That was what he was going to do. And he knew that. That's what I'm going to do. I've got a job. God has given me a job. I'm going to go and build the walls. But in order to do this, I want you to notice what he didn't do. He didn't get a group of men together and say, listen, God has shown me this and we're going to go and build the walls. He didn't say, listen, we better get a bit of money together and get a big collection to see what we can do here. Get these walls up. I want you to notice he didn't do any of those things. Now, God had planted the seed in him, but I want you to notice that God had far more to do than just plant the seed. There was far more to be done than that. He could have jumped too quick. He could have moved in the flesh. But he was willing. He was willing to leave Shushan the palace to go all the way to this terrible broken down place called Jerusalem. To leave luxury to go to that was, which was lamentable to go to that. You know, you'll never be at your Jerusalem until you leave your Shushan. You'll never get there. And so, what happens is, he hears the word of the Lord, and the Lord speaks to him, and you know what he does? He begins, he sits down with shock, first of all, because he didn't anticipate things as bad. He didn't think it was as bad. But the news had come directly. And that's why it's so important that you seek to walk in fullness of the Holy Spirit and to walk daily with the Lord, to have time with God in prayer, to let God speak to you in the silence in prayer because God will tell you what's going on as it is. You'll not be hearing what a pastor or preacher or tape has to say, but you will hear and you will sense exactly how it is. And so he sat down with shock when he recognized what had happened and what was happening. He wept. He wept. Now, what I want to say to you is that weeping here is not just emotion. This is not a man who just, you know, is a little moved and feeling a little bit of sympathy and just, you know, a little tear coming down his cheek. No, no. This is the tears of the Holy Spirit. 
these tears originate with God. Because God has planted with the seed in this man's heart, God has planted how he feels. And as this man gets the feelings and the emotions and how God is looking down on this situation, so God and Nehemiah link. They become fused together in the great calling that he has. That's why he doesn't need to get any big thing promoted. That's why he doesn't need to start some big thing to get the ball rolling because it's just initially him and God because God will look after all the details. What's important is that he's in touch with God and so he's weeping and it means to mourn or to sob bitterly and continually. This man for a period of three to four months finds himself breaking down in emotion and weeping before God. And the source of his weeping is the fact that the people of God are so vulnerable that the work of God is not going forward and that the temple, although it's built, the people of God are in a place of failure and futility and disappointment and discouragement. And there's all types of immorality and there's all types of impropriety in business, desecration of the Sabbath, and many other things are going on. And this from God is pouring into Nehemiah's heart. And as he's doing his job, he's finding little corners to run into and fall down and weep. Now, if you've ever read the life of George Whitfield, George Whitfield was the great preacher used by God in America and England during the 18th century revival. And George Whitfield frequently, whenever he was walking from, he had his, all his gowns on him, he was a preacher, but as he was traveling from one location of preaching to another, on occasions he had to dismount from his, his horse or else go into a field and there he would lie down in the field. Not that he was just deciding to be holy or he wanted to become a great spiritual Christian, but because this amazing burden came upon him regarding the people that he was going to preach to. And there he would weep and sob and cry before God as God put his burden, his desire, his awareness of where these people were. He would burn it and fuse it into the heart of his servant while he lay prostrate, weeping on the ground. And whenever he went to preach, all heaven was with him. And people dropped when he was preaching, they said on one occasion, it was like a battlefield where the people dropped under the power of conviction of sin. This is where our fathers used to be. This is the way preachers used to pray. This is the way generations ago when men and women sought God in the work of God, this was common in their prayer time and in their prayer life, weeping before God. Today it's so calculated. It's so right. The words are all spewed out. It's all evangelical. It's all so predictable and all so powerless. So powerless. But when a sob comes in, when a cry comes in, then God is in it. And when God is in it, it becomes powerful. Powerful. This man was experiencing that great weeping. He prayed. The Bible says he sat down and he wept and he prayed. That word prayer means to mediate, to intervene, to make judgment favorable. That's what it means. He was mediating on behalf of the people. You can't decide to do that just as a Christian. Don't you try to do this. It'll burn you out after a few hours. You couldn't do it. Some Christians say, oh, that's what I want to do. You'll never do it. You need the Holy Ghost to do that, something like this. 
the Holy Spirit. But perhaps that is your destiny. Perhaps that is your calling. Maybe God is going to draw you aside. Maybe God is putting a seed in your heart. Maybe God is going to pour his heart into your heart. And you are going to start to feel what God feels. And you are going to start to weep. And you are going to start to pray. Because you're discovering it's not you anymore. It's God in you. That's what Paul said, is no longer I that liveth, it's Christ that is living in me. His life is pouring through me. Paul says, I'm shedding his tears. I have his burden for the lost. I have his messages for the people. Paul was always aware that there was a supernatural power that was heavenly and divine, was always carrying him. That's the greatest need in the church today. Let's draw to a close in his prayers. I want you to look briefly for a few moments at his prayer that he prayed. First of all, in his introduction to his prayer, in verse 5, he said, I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God. That is some introduction to prayer. To a man that's weeping. To a man who's waiting on God. To a man who has received his calling and is beginning to unfold his destiny. This is how he sees God. Now what I want to ask you tonight is how do you see God? How do you see him? He said, I see him as the great and the terrible God. Some of the other translations of the scripture use this text, and what they introduce are a few other words. They say that he's not only fearful and terrible, but they said he's dreadful. Dreadful. And I was trying to think, what, whatever in my life has ever produced the emotions of being fearful, dreadful, and terrible, that I could think of an event in my life that produced that kind of an impact, that I recall something being fearful, dreadful, and terrible. And you know, my mind just went to one event, 9-11. It was the only event that my mind could think of that I, I can remember it so well. And it was, it was dreadful. Because something was happening that had never happened before. You were into another realm that, that people couldn't grasp it. The enormity of it and the fearfulness of it and the dread of what was still going to happen. And here in addressing God, did he see God? In his prayers and in his groanings before God, did Nehemiah see God in heaven? And did he cry out in in prayer, crying out? Did he say, you're the great and the terrible? You're a terrible God? You're a fearful God? You're a dreadful God? Is that what he saw? These are the type of things happen when people meet God. That's why I have to ask the question, When we go to our churches, are we meeting God? Are we meeting God? You find that the average church, I remember Leonard Ravenhill says, there's many people go out laughing and amused and so on and so forth. We've all done it. But how many places do they tiptoe out? How many places do they go out of the sanctuary afraid to speak? Because God's presence has come down. How many places do you go into where the people sit silent because of the holy awe of God's presence resting on them? These things may seem foreign to us, but all these things have occurred during periods of revival and are very normal and natural to periods of revival when God comes down, the great and terrible God comes down. That was his introduction. 
I want you to notice very briefly the key component of this prayer as he enters into prayer is that of God's promise. He introduces the promises of God, and he begins to tell God of how he has promised to look after his people. And if they fail, if they repent, they'll come back and so on. And dear friends, you are making advancement in your Christian life when you begin to plead God's promises that he has given to you. If God has given you a promise, as Esther shared with us the other night, you need to open that book where that promise is, and you need to get into the throne room where God is, and you need to agree with God your destiny, and you declare that promise, and you say, it will happen because God told me it, and I believe it, and nothing will shake me from it, and enter into your destiny via the promises of God. It's amazing how many prayer meetings you go to. Promises are never pleaded. They're never pleaded. It's just general praying. But advancement is being made in prayer when you plead the promises of God before his throne. The condition for which God would work is again alluded to, and that is that there would be heart preparation, that there would be true repentance, he talks about them turning from their sin. He said, if we turn and confess our sins, Lord, you will come and you will visit us again. That's continually the theme of prayer whenever we find the great servants of God pleading over the nation. Now, what, what we find also is that in verse 6 and 7, we come into verse 7, Verse 6, Now let thine ears be attentive and thine eyes open, that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant, which I pray before thee now, day and night. Day and night. Is he not sleeping? Of course he's sleeping. What's he saying? He's saying, when I waken up, I'm praying. He says, whenever I'm doing my business in the palace, I'm praying. I have a burden. I have a burden from the Lord, and I'm praying. I'm pleading his promises before his throne. I'm bringing them to God every day. I know my destiny. I am pleading it before God, and it's very earnest. This is not a passing thing. This is nothing like a fizz that comes for a few weeks because of an evangelistic campaign or some convention that comes, and after a few months it is buzzed out of me, a bit like what they call uh, fizzy, fizzy orange Christians, you hear the fizzy orange, you give it a good shake and you open the lid and they're all buzz, and then after a wee while there's no buzz left. No, no, this is something from the Holy Spirit. Where that inner desire stays, it continues. It comes from God. And then he says very clearly, and with this we are closing, his earnestness. I remember hearing of the Lewis revival that some of the people who worked, and they're hard workers up there, they had the crofts. It was difficult looking after sheep and cattle and various livestock, hard work. But those men that were in the revival, they would have prayed maybe all night, all night. And they had gone to church maybe arriving at four or five in the, after, in the evening, and then they maybe didn't get out to two in the morning for service wouldn't stop. The preachers couldn't get them to stop, couldn't get the people to stop praying, couldn't get the people to leave the church. People were getting converted here and there and yonder on the streets, falling on the roadside among the peats, getting converted. People that hadn't even heard the gospel. People that nobody had come to visit or give a tract to. God was smiting them under conviction. They were coming to, con to conversion. A new birth, just like that. Solid Christians. Under the power of the Holy Spirit. I remember one of the farmers being interviewed and he said, Although we got no sleep, he said, when I was working in the farm, he said, the buckets were jumping into my hands. He said, I was just praying, praying all the time, praying for God to work, praying that the Spirit of God would keep coming on the meetings, praying that God would fill the preacher with the Holy Ghost, praying that it would spread out into the other villages. He said, that was, you're just praying without ceasing. That's wonderful. It's wonderful. 
When you hear that, my dear friends, very hard to stick with what we've got. Very hard to cope with church prayer meetings. Terrible. Diabolical. And we call it Christianity. And it's no more true Christianity than heaven is hell. It's that far away. When you have people banging hymn books and snapping their little cases together to say the prayer meeting's over and the people come out and they say, oh, it was good to be here and the same three people prayed and they've done it for the last 40 years. God help us, there's something seriously wrong. I don't care how good the ministry is. I don't care if that place is packed to the neck. If there's no power in the prayer meeting and there's no sense of God, you're not cutting ice. You're not cutting ice. And what this man did, and we close, I promise, is there is confession. Look at verse 7. We have dealt very corruptly against thee. Now I want you to notice in three other translations of the Scripture what, how that was interpreted or how they translated it. Here's what they say. This is what Nehemiah now is talking about the people of God. He's got this burden in his heart. He's got close to God. He saw the throne of God. And this is what he said. We have dealt corruptly against thee. Now this is what he's saying in three different, looking at the Greek Hebrew language from three, three different angles. We have abandoned you, one said. God, we have abandoned you. Does that not resonate today? Do you not think that there could be an element of truth today? That we have abandoned God? We have done you a great wrong. That's what one other said. We have done God a great wrong. And then here's the other one. We have been seduced by vanity. We have been seduced by vanity. What does it all mean? It means, as Nehemiah is confessing, he said, Lord, we've broken all your laws. Now, my dear friends, as I close, I know that there are arguments raised on radio and TV and all, and I'm sure it has its place. But do you not think whenever a society begins to marry two men and two women, do you not think whenever children are given legal status and help from government to change their sex as children? Do you not think whenever justice and judiciary pass laws that are totally contrary to the will of God, do you not think when those things are going on that we have abandoned God? Do you not think that? Do you not think that we have done God a great wrong? Do you not think that we have given ourselves over continually to vanity and broken all his laws? How does God feel? You know, I hear all these people saying, this is how I feel, this is how she feels, this is how this party feels. Do you know, I would love somebody to say, how does God Almighty feel? What does the God of heaven, as the stench, as the sin, as it rises up to heaven, going up from this earth, the stench of it rising up, breaking the laws of God, and yet his mercy continues. He still sends the rain on the just and the unjust. He still is merciful to the sinner, and this stench is rising up all the time. Isn't he amazing that he lets us live? Isn't it amazing that he lets us do these things? The great confession. He confesses not only his own sins, but look at it in closing in verse 7. Or verse 6. We confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against thee, both I and my father's house have sinned. I want you to notice as we close that this man didn't only confess his own sins, which we should do. But this man confessed the sins of the nation. Because the Jews had an understanding of generational sin. 
They understood the curses that come down the generational line. They knew that, and so they were repenting on behalf of their ancestors how wickedly they had lived. And Nehemiah is saying, Lord of mercy, what we have done, what our fathers have done, how our loved ones have lived, the living outside marriage, fornication, uncleanness, incest, abuse, rape, destruction, control, manipulation. On you go, God, we have lived such vile lives. And look at the impact that it's having in society. Lord, we're sorry. We're sorry for this awful sin. And we're begging you, Lord, to come back. We're begging you to have mercy on this land again. John Bunyan, he wrote Pilgrim's Progress, said, Prayer is a shield to the soul, a sacrifice to God, and a scourge to Satan. One commentator, before I came out, I read this. He said, the greatest thing any man or woman can do for God and for man is to pray. To pray. That's our calling. Barbers are called to cut hair. Dentists are called to sort out teeth. Policemen are called to protect the community. Christians are called to pray. Let's bow. Our Father, we pray that the Holy Spirit of God would take thy truth and apply it, Lord, as it would please thee in all our lives that you would do a stirring, Lord, in lives, that you would create a hunger and plant a seed, Lord, in a heart or in hearts tonight, that someone will get married to God's will, that someone will say, Lord, that's where I want to be. That's the type of Christian I want to be. And though no one join me, still I will follow. Lord, would you grant that by your Spirit? Would you meet those hearts that are seeking you just now? And would you unfold your purposes and glorify your name? For Christ's sake. Amen.